Greetings to all. We would like to thank you for joining us for the 29th edition of the Annual Investment Meeting webinar series. Today, we are presenting Building Back Better, Leveraging Women-Owned SMEs for Economic Growth. My name is Karen Pizon, Investor Relations for AIM, and I'll be your MC for today. The Annual Investment Meeting is the largest investment platform in the world. An initiative of the UAE Ministry of Economy, AIM has been promoting a healthier global economy by linking investment opportunities to fast-growing economies under six key pillars, foreign direct investment, foreign portfolio investment, small and medium enterprise, startups, and future cities, with a special event, One Belt, One Road. We would like to thank our multilateral partner, Islamic Corporation for the Development of the Private Sector, for sponsoring today's webinar. This webinar is also sponsored by Etihad Credit Insurance, the UAE's federal export credit company. Etihad Credit Insurance provides solutions guaranteed to help UAE exporters and businesses navigate through this difficult time. Find out more about ECI offerings, please email info at ecai.gov.ae. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. If you experience any issues with your audio or video during the webinar, just refresh your browser and that should take care of everything. We would suggest using Chrome, Firefox, or Opera. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the questions box and the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you like a specific question, vote for it under the question tab so we can address it to our speakers. Right now, ladies and gentlemen, we are running live polls located beside the question tab. So we request you all to please participate by casting your votes. In today's webinar, our experts will discuss the case for inclusive growth through women-owned SMEs and how best to support women-owned SMEs with a focus on access to markets and finance. Subject matter experts will present best practice examples of gender-inclusive sourcing and finance. I would now like to introduce the keynote speaker and the moderator for today's webinar, Ms. Elizabeth Vasquez. Who is the CEO and co-founder of WeConnect International. She is a world leader in women's economic empowerment and global supplier diversity and inclusion. She is the co-author of the book, Buying for Impact, How to Buy from Women and Change Our World. As the head of WeConnect International, she is responsible for mission delivery, including support for women business owners based in over 120 countries and member buyers representing over US $1 trillion in annual purchasing power. After her keynote speech, she will be joined by a panel of experts. And without further ado, we'll turn the time over to our wonderful speakers. And please, Ms. Elizabeth, come on stage. Thank you so much, Karen, for the introduction. I am just honored to be a part of this conversation with some leading experts, uh, ambassador from the US, um, a corporate executive who's been doing this longer than most, uh, and some outstanding women business owners. Um, I'm thrilled that the Ministry for the Economy is leading on this and that AIM is bringing us all together to have a conversation about how to build back better, how to leverage women-owned SMEs to help grow the economy. On the next slide, just a quick overview, you'll see that unfortunately today, women-owned businesses, this is, you know, people that represent half the world's population and about a third of the world's private businesses earn only about 1% of the spend by large corporations and governments around the world. So women, while they are increasingly owning and growing businesses, they unfortunately are basically invisible in global value chains. And that's not a, a good number if we want to uh, grow the economy and create jobs at this particular moment in time. On the next slide, you'll see that there are many corporations that are leading this effort. 
uh, they created this nonprofit, We Connect International, because they believe there is a business case for buying more products and services from women-owned businesses. And we do hope that in the future, there will be many more UAE-based corporations uh, that are leading this effort. And I'm certain that that will happen. On the next slide, you'll see that women in the UAE according to the Ministry of Finance, make up 70% of university graduates. So they're really smart and they're really talented and they make up almost half of the workforce at 46.6% and 10% of the leadership within private sector companies. And so that number is also growing. And according to Arabnet and Dubai SME, local investments in teams with at least one female founder equaled a quarter of all the deal flow in uh, 2018. So that's very encouraging that we're seeing more women founders um, as part of the uh, teams that are going after and winning investments. Now, the UAE has stated very publicly that it intends to become one of the top 25 countries for gender equality. And I know that that is possible if we all work together and that's the purpose of this conversation today. On the next slide, you'll see that there is a way for organizations to find women-owned businesses and to know that they are women-owned businesses. There's a certification that we apply to ensure that um, a business is at least 51% owned um, by one or more women, that it's managed by women, controlled by women, and independent. And this helps to ensure that if we're going to go out of our way to buy from both men-owned businesses and women-owned businesses, that we know where to find these women suppliers and that they are, in fact, um, owned by women. And that's because of the way women spend their money. They tend to spend more of it on their families and their communities, um, both men and women, boys and girls. And so everyone benefits. On the next slide. You'll see that um, this is something that is a type of movement. We already have women self-registered for free in 120 countries, but we can also certify with local partners in almost 60% of the world's population. And these are the countries where we can right now certify that these are women-owned businesses and they're in a searchable database. What's unfortunate, as you'll see, is there are almost no countries um, in uh, the Middle East that are um, participating. Uh, in, in these opportunities. And so we need to change that because the women in the UAE and in the region in general are truly outstanding. And we all need to benefit from their innovation, um, their passion, their ability to create jobs and their leadership. On the next slide, you'll see that um, women are looking for a community. They want to work with other women business owners and they also want to be found by buyers, qualified buyers that are committed to giving them an equal opportunity to compete and to win business. Um, we offer education, um, there's an academy, the, there's a lot of free training for women business owners. There's a lot of networking where you bring together buyers and sellers, um, events and matchmakers. And then of course, um, intelligence, you know, what are, what are the buyers looking for and how can women-owned businesses anticipate the needs of those buyers? And um, we also want to make sure that it's easy for buyers and sellers to find each other. We want to make sure that there's a searchable database uh, that, that everyone can use um, to, to find each other and to connect. So on the next slide, you'll see that there is a business case for why corporations like IBM do this. Uh, yes, it has great social impact, but the truth is these corporations want to mirror their um, customer base and their employee base. They want to support their clients that are looking for more inclusion. Increasingly, governments are looking for inclusive economic growth. They want to support business growth. They want to look for innovation that they don't right now have access to if women aren't knocking on their doors. They might have local or national content requirements. Um, they want to improve costs through increased uh, competitiveness in their supply chain. They want to have local 
knowledge and local networks, and they want to, of course, enhance their brand with local communities. So these are just some of the highlights for the business case of why buyers um, are seeking women-owned suppliers. On the next slide is just a, a, some contact information. Um, but more importantly, I think now is the opportunity for, for me to get to turn it over to the experts um, to talk about uh, you know, how does their organization support women-owned businesses uh, and what are the challenges to the success in, in the UAE. So at this time, um, I would love to turn it over to our first expert, uh, he is a true champion um, with deep passion for inclusion. Um, Ambassador Rokolta is uh, uh, absolutely um, uh, you know, documenting in various articles and hosting various events, um, ways to bring everyone together, to increase trade, to increase business, both in the UAE uh, and also um, uh, between the UAE, the United States and throughout the region. So Ambassador, um, thank you very, very much for taking the time to talk with us and to, to share your vision uh, for women as business owners. And I would love to hear your thoughts on the work that you're doing in this space. Well, good morning uh, and good evening to everyone. Uh, the amazing thing about Zoom and similar platforms is we get to be connected all around the world. So I'm very happy to be here this, uh, this day. And so first, let me start off by saying that in order for us to really move the women movement, we, we need authentic leaders, uh, people who absolutely believe that this is not only the right thing to do, uh, we need to balance uh, uh, the resources of society uh, across all spectrums. And we also have to take advantage of the fact that, that we have a real talent shortage in the world today. Uh, education is of course a big part of that, but given women, the opportunity to compete equally and fairly with men uh, can do nothing but bring more prosperity to the world uh, at large. Uh, in addition to it's fair, uh, it's equal, and um, uh, there is a really strong business case for this kind of diversity, which I won't go into. Um, I've got three minutes to speak, and I thought that I would uh, talk just a little bit about uh, a couple of the uh, things that we did that we found to be very, very successful, and that was mentoring and joint venture. Um, when you think about a large customer, a buyer, and the large spends that they have, uh, we need to find uh, really good uh, partners who, who want to move this ball forward. And in the case of our company back in, uh, in the United States when I was uh, in business, uh, we found that in the auto industry, in the Toyotas, the General Motors, the Fords of the world, who understood the, uh, the need and actually committed uh, to a percentage of their spend on an annual basis uh, in, for, for women and uh, other, other diverse kind of companies. And so the way we handled it was to form joint ventures with women-owned businesses. They were in charge. They, they owned more than 50% of the joint venture, in some cases 51, others 60. Uh, and we provided, as a company, we were, did exactly the same thing. Uh, but what we provided was the experience, the processes, uh, sometimes the capital, uh, the systems, uh, the know-how on how to actually go about and produce significant added value uh, for our customer together. And, and these relationships have blossomed uh, in, into wide ranging efforts. Uh, in some cases, our, our partners have gone off on their own and become very, very successful, no longer needing a, a mentor. And I think that that matriculation is a very, very important part to establishing an overall e uh, ecosystem uh, where women begin to emerge and you start to change that 1% to five and 10 and 15. Uh, I will also say that we really need to, um, uh, we really need this certification. Uh, we don't, uh, fronts as what we call them in the United States are, are something that are damaging to the, uh, to the process and to the effort. Uh, we also need to do better in organizing all this networking that you're speaking of. Uh, and I believe that uh, finally uh, we need to measure. Uh, we need to measure success in real metrics uh, and they need to be measured on at least a half year basis. I prefer quarterly, uh, goals must be set. And I'll leave you with this final thought. And that is, is that when I spoke initially about authentic leadership, 
you need to have support from the very, very top of the company. This, this We do need to engage everyone, but with support from the very top, measuring on a, a quarterly basis, having established goals, making sure that we uh, meet those goals uh, is the way to go forward. And that's how we've achieved success uh, in our 20 year journey along this pathway. Uh, I'll turn it back over to you. Elizabeth, uh, you're on uh, mute. <laughs> Thank you, Ambassador. You have to love technology, right? But it is amazing that we're all able to come together, whether we're in the UAE or in the US, to have this important conversation. And we're so grateful for your leadership um, in this particular area. It's just one of many areas that, that you're working on. But um, the time that you're personally taking uh, to ensure that there is equal opportunity um, is really uh, wonderful to, to observe and to get to listen to. So thank you. Um, speaking of wonderful leaders with deep commitment and passion for inclusion, um, it is my honor to introduce to all of you uh, the head of global supplier diversity and inclusion for IBM, Michael K. Robinson. Uh, Michael is unable to join us via video, but he is joining us via audio while on the road. And uh, I, I know that we will all enjoy hearing from Michael um, and his experience in, uh, from a corporate perspective. Um, so Michael, let me turn it over to you. Well, and hopefully everyone can hear me now. Uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. It is my extreme pleasure to participate in this program. And as Elizabeth mentioned, technology is a wonderful item. It allows us to uh, communicate throughout the world. But at the same time, there are is there may be issues with technology, such as I'm not able to be on video. But as a business, the thing that it teaches us, we have to pivot. You have to adjust to the situation that you're in and continue to move forward. And that's something corporations and WBEs have to do also. And I'll just give you a, an overview of our program. IBM's program has been in effect from a supply diversity standpoint since 1968. And IBM is one of the founding corporate members of We Connect International. And as Elizabeth mentioned, uh, we found it essential because our program started in 1968 in the U.S. and we had been working with women-owned and minority-owned businesses in the U.S. and we understood the value that they brought to us. We understood the value from a customer set. We understood the value from a responsiveness that uh, women-owned and diverse suppliers were responsive. They helped us with innovation. Uh, so what we decided to do right around the turn of uh, the century in 2002, 2003, we took our program global. And as soon as an organization such as WeConnect was developed, we understood the value that it would bring, and we have been a part of WeConnect uh, globally uh, since its inception. I would mention to all of the women-owned businesses who are listening, reach out to WeConnect, understand the value that they bring, understand how they can not only connect you with other I mean, with corporations, but more importantly, how they can connect you with other women-owned businesses. And that is an area of opportunity I think businesses forget uh, doing WBE to WBE. And I'll say from a corporate standpoint, as you are engaging with corporations, uh, you heard the ambassador and you heard Elizabeth speak to the fact that the corporations are looking for WBEs and diverse owned businesses from some of the programs and IBM has a mentoring program. Uh, the things that we do and we've learned, a key factor that you have to have is access for diverse owned businesses. IBM operates in 170 plus countries, and in every country in which we operate, we have a policy or process that ensures that women-owned and diverse-owned businesses 
if they can provide value add to our supply chain, they are given the opportunity to participate in the supply chain. And just as the ambassador was talking about from a mentoring standpoint and a measuring standpoint, we have KPIs or our key metrics that we measure on a monthly basis that are presented to our chief procurement officer and supplier diversity is one of those metrics that we look at spend. We look at what we're doing from a developmental standpoint. So we are actively involved and we're monitoring and we want to ensure that we're given that opportunity. Now, from a WBE standpoint or supplier standpoint, the thing that I would tell each and every one of you is know your customer. There is so much information that you can get off of the web today. Understand who your customer is. Understand if your product or your service can fit into their supply chain. Also understand that everybody is not your customer. And when you meet a corporation, you have a very few moments to be able to articulate, here is my company. Here's what my company does. Here's my product or, in, or my service. Here's how my product and my service can fit into your supply chain. And here's the value add that I can bring to your supply chain. And be specific because not every company can do everything. And when you're asked a question, what can you do? Please do not say everything. No one company can do everything. So be precise. Be specific and tell what's the value add that you can bring. And as the ambassador just said, I know I only have a few moments, so I, I will turn it back over to you, Elizabeth, but hopefully this provided some input and some information to those who are listening today. Thank you so much, Michael. I always appreciate your words of wisdom and always learn from you. So <laughs> grateful you could participate. And now to Dr. Bader, who's the CEO of Envision Partnership and uh, really an outstanding woman in business who shares her experience um, with audiences all over the world. Uh, so Dr. Bader, if I could please turn to you for um, some insights about your business and challenges and opportunities you see in the UAE. Dr. Bader? Hi. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for this opportunity. Uh, and uh, yes, we need more people like yourself, like Michael, like uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, to support us here in the MENA region. When I started myself in, in executive search, and actually until now, I'm the only woman uh, that uh, owns and leads executive search in the MENA region. So it's been really challenging to be uh, kind of rubbing shoulders with with a, with kind of uh, you know male pale uh, uh, dominant uh, in a way uh, sector. Uh, however, uh, there are so many lessons that I've learned along the way, and one of the most important one that uh, drives our business actually to be catering specifically to a place to find to search to develop and to promote uh, female leadership in the region. And this is what we have been doing for the last couple of decades. And finally, last year, we were able to achieve 50%. So we've been trying over the clients and try to convince them about having more diversified shortlist. Let us just show you what are the capacity that we can have in the region, because we do have a perception that in our part of the world, women are not so courageous or risk, risk taker to be responsible for commercial roles, leadership roles, PNL. And we tried so hard to shake this, uh, you know, uh, perception and try to prove this perception wrong uh, by, by action. And we were very lucky uh, to have engaged with remarkable female leaders that we were able to place in, in you know, Fortune 500 companies uh, and others. Um, and accompany them during their journey gave us the learning about the pains and the strength and the challenges that they have been facing. And coming back to our clients with this feedback uh, to enable us to work together on a better format that can have more diversity and inclusion. Because sometimes we do a good job in terms of the numbers, 
but we don't do a good job in terms of inclusion. And this is where it's, it's really a, an equally important issue that we work very closely with clients to try to ensure that we are working on that aspects and we do have the right medium to enable women to flourish, to contribute, to voice uh, you know, uh, their, their uh, ideas, et cetera. And also try to come to the conclusion together with clients about the do and don'ts, what will work in terms of having more inclusive environment and what wouldn't work. And how can we overcome uh, these obstacles through what we know and through what will come along and we don't know, like for example, what we have now with, with pandemic uh, globally. So I always say female leaders do exist globally and also in our region, but we need to dig hard and make an effort to find them, not just you know surface the first layer that we find and that's it. And I always say we don't do miracles. If they exist, we will find them. If they don't exist, we will develop them. And this is what we have been doing, working hand in hand with females with potential that have the passion to you know, develop their career and then lead the way together into developing this pipeline that we can offer to clients. Wow, thank you, Dr. Bader. You're such a wonderful role model for all of us and we're very lucky to have you in the We Connect International Network. Um, so much more to learn and I have some more questions for you. I'll come back to you. Um, for now, I did want to um, know that, um, I would, did want to find out from the ambassador, um, what's your vision for the role and the potential of women and businesses um, in the, uh, not just the UAE, I think in the region in general, but the, the opportunities to access US markets and other markets. Yeah, I have um, to go, Keith, I have to get back on the call, bye. I think we're good, thank you, sir. <sighs> Hi, ambassador. Um, I know you're super busy and we're thrilled to, to um, have the opportunity to ask your opinion of what are some of the next steps? Um, what's your sort of vision for the, the role of women in the UAE, trade opportunities with the US? Um, would, would love to know, especially in the midst of COVID where women are, you know, who own businesses, desperate to keep the doors open, keep people employed, find ways to deliver their products and services. Um, what, what are your thoughts on next steps? I think there's two next steps. Uh, I think we have to continue to organize. So far, all we've been doing is networking and presenting our case. And we've been warmly received by the Emirati government, by industry leaders, and there's an enormous amount of excitement uh, from women. But the next step is now to go to that next process. And that is to begin uh, the, what I call the long and arduous road of finding opportunities. Uh, we need to find uh, value for these companies, contracts, if you will, uh, and we need to find uh, uh, whether they're ministries or, or other companies that will do what similarly was done in the United States. And each company pledge that a certain small percentage, and this would be just a goal, it wouldn't be a mandatory set aside, that one or two percent of their annual spend uh, would be a goal uh, to begin to uh, uh, award to women businesses. And this is where I think that these kind of joint ventures are very, very important. Uh, if we're up to me, I would uh, try to partner with the chambers, uh, which have 1,500 uh, basically male-dominated companies, and see if we could get a few of them to enter into some kind of mentorship program. Uh, yes, it means giving up a little bit of the revenue, but I think that the long-term uh, rewards in terms of the expansion of the economy, uh, uh, of access uh, for women to, uh, to be able to participate in a greater, uh, greater role, uh, the use of uh, uh, talent, uh, which is in great shortage, especially good talent. And you have to, you have to believe that uh, of the initial interest by women-owned businesses, these are the brightest and the best, the most forward-leaning, uh, and so I, th and that's the hard part to do, uh, that authentic leadership that say, look, I'm gonna sacrifice a little bit of perhaps what be my volume of business in order to promote a women-owned business because I know in the end of the day, that'll create even more value for me, the majority company. So I think that that's actually the next step. Uh, not everybody agrees with my vision, some people prefer to do it a little bit differently, and that's 
okay because I think the space is big enough for a lot of different initiatives across the board. Thank you, Ambassador. I love your emphasis on public-private partnerships, working with civil society to try th to try something. Right? Let's let's not allow this crisis to um, keep us from moving forward. There are many opportunities that this creates. In fact, um, we did a survey of women and businesses in all these different countries, and they're innovating. They're using this as an opportunity to develop new products and services, to leverage technology to uh, do their work, to um, come up with um, new ways of creating efficiencies. And so I love your vision for how do we move forward and become even stronger um, going forward by relying on the strength of each other. Uh, so, so thank you for sharing that vision of, of the role of chambers, of the roles of government, of the private sector setting goals. Um, I would love to actually turn that question over to Michael. Um, you have been doing this for many years now. Um, and, and so how, how do we begin to set baselines and goals and be more inclusive in how we spend our money? Michael? Yes. Yes. What I would say is, and I will follow on from some of the comments that you made, Elizabeth, and some of the comments from the ambassador. Uh, from a corporate standpoint, I think each and every corporation has to be aware of, I'll say it's, and I'll look at it two ways. Number one is social responsibility. From the standpoint of, are we serving and representing the communities in which our organizations are a part of? But I, you have to look at it from the other part also, from the standpoint of looking for innovation, looking for technology. And in order to be the best, you have to utilize the best. And if you are a B2B and IBM is a B2B, we want to make sure that we are seeking those companies who can provide us the most innovative products, the most innovative services, because at times people forget that IBM is a supplier also. And we have to look at our supply chain and bring in those companies who are providing us that innovation, that technology, that value add. And I would say, look as a WBE also, look at the organizations such as WeConnect. You want to look at it in, from a company standpoint, who are those companies that you're going to go after? Uh, and those companies have to be more inclusive from a supply chain standpoint. I would say the diverse-owned business or women-owned businesses have to associate with NGOs such as WeBank. And think, I mean, as WeConnect, because think about it. When you join or when you register, you're not only a local company, but you are a worldwide company. And if you're on the internet, you are worldwide, and you want to get your you want to get your uh, product out. You want to get the the communications out on the things that you're doing, and then also look at it from a local governmental standpoint, because I do agree with those statements that have been made. In most countries, the government is the largest procurer of all products or services. And there has to be some type of mandates, and I'll take it from the, as we're doing in the U.S. The U.S. government has requirements, and the requirements are for, the key word is small, because they want to grow small businesses. A small woman-owned, which would be uh, certified women-owned businesses, small disadvantaged business, which are really minority-owned businesses. So the government has mandates for companies who are doing business with them. So every business in the U.S. or for a proposal that they have that's over 700, I believe 750,000 U.S. dollars, they have to have a small business component of it. And that's how you get those small women-owned businesses in the governmental sector. You have them from a requirement standpoint, you grow them, and then they can grow and diversify. And the last point I will make is, as you are growing, ensure that you are not dependent upon one particular customer. 
no matter if that is a private company of the government, you want to diversify so that if a hiccup happens, your business continue to grow. So and I'll, with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Elizabeth. Wonderful words of wisdom. Thank you, Michael, very much uh, for sharing the how to, how do we get from where we are to where we want to be. Um, I would love to ask um, the, the woman business owner, our representative, Dr. Bader, um, you know, based on your experience, what's your vision for women as business owners in the UAE? What are some things that you've done that have helped you uh, to, to grow your business and to um, reach the success that you've achieved throughout the region? Dr. Bader? Yeah, thank you. Well, surely we do have great potential here and simply because of the smaller contribution that we have so far. So the potential is really enormous. And like the statistics that you've mentioned, we do have amazing talents in terms of female. So a couple of points I would say, to be courageous, to be more risk taker, and that applies both, you know, if you wanna open your own business or if you want to have a leadership role within corporate. Statistics shows, for example, that if we have a vacancy, a man that thinks he can do 60% of the job will apply fully hearted and that they can, you know, really present themselves strongly and believe in it versus a woman wouldn't do this un unless if she's 100% or 120% sure that she can do it. The same thing apply for, you know, starting your own business. Uh, there, there are, nowadays, it's much easier than when I started. Nowadays, you know, the government, it's one of the most leading governments where we have 50% of the contribution, if not even more, you know, in the parliament that is coming from diversified female, younger generation, you know, different type of, of slates that, that always provides much more wealth to, you know, to bring to the table from innovation part, from problem solving, from, you know, inclusion, uh, from all aspects. And the, the, the key to success for any SME is always, you know, the basic three elements, which is access to finance, access to, if you will, talent, you know, HR, how do I run my business? How do I build my leadership? and the access to the right network. And, you know, I agree with all what have been said about networks and like Mr. Ambassador mentioned, we had enough of network, let's get into action to some extent. But also in terms of the networking, you know, when I started, I tried for so many times to find organization where I can register with them as a female owned business. And I found zillions in the States, but all of them were national and nothing is related to this part of the world, for example. So we need more accessibility to, to things like that. And, and to Michael, I would say, since you represent, you know, the Fortune 500 companies, it will be great if, you know, scaling down, if you will, those kind of processes that you have for inclusion from, from a procurement point of view to, to the region, because in many cases, I've been into contacts with organizations that I know, for example, in the States, they do have a specific practice for that, but nobody is aware about it here. And, you know, th there is no way that we can break through the barrier just to be included. And, you know, what, one of the ideas that I always think about is quota. I used to hate quota when I was younger because I thought it was, you know, disrespectful for us as female that we just need to be added for the number's sake. However, quota is a practical way of doing things. And, you know, I think we need to have quota in both in terms of recruiting for leadership roles, as well as for SMEs to engage with organizations, be it, you know, public, private, uh, in all aspects, because that is the tool that will enable women to have access and to be visible and to engage. But then by the end of the day, the choice is purely should be for the most credible, for the most qualified to do the job. So quota is good for, you know, opening the door, but it shouldn't be at all the deciding factor in terms of selection, in my opinion. And, and nowadays with, with how the world is evolving, I think we do have more and more opportunities for female across the globe, but more so in the whole Middle East especially now that we can work out of home, you know, the digital transformation that we have. So regardless, if you're a mother, if you're pregnant, if you have kids, it doesn't matter, you can do it. You know, there are so many different platforms that is enabling us, empowering us to do more. 
and and you know we just need to believe in ourselves and find the right resources uh, you know like what we've heard and learned about today and and try to to use that so um, th that's it how i see it and i hope you know we will be seeing more and more smes led women here in uae and in the region Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Bader. Um, I'm seeing that we have a lot of questions in the chat. So we would love to invite all of you to please um, share your questions, um, your experience, so that we can have an interactive conversation uh, for the next few minutes. Uh, I do see a lot of questions having to do with access to finance or investment. Um, there's a new report out by the Council on Scaling Women-Owned Businesses that actually makes the linkages um, between access to markets and access to finance and how important it is for women to come to the table with contracts uh, or with you know, clients. And it makes it so much easier for them to get investment from investors or to get a loan uh, from a bank. And so there is a direct linkage between organic growth through sales and uh, through access to finance. And just as you said, Dr. Bader, the, these are all intimately linked with all the things that have been mentioned by our other um, panel experts on capacity development. Um, Ambassador, I know that you have been working very closely uh, with uh, various um, agencies throughout the UAE, including in uh, Abu Dhabi, for example, and audio has done a lot in the investment space um, and looking to see what could be done for inclusion. Um, and so just wanted to know if you had any thoughts um, about those linkages. Uh, I, I don't have any specific about audio themselves, except to say that uh, there is a tremendous amount of uh, both anticipation and excitement about what the next step should be. Um, and you brought up a very interesting point in uh, where does the capital come from? I think there are a number of models uh, and uh, in terms of how women progress. Uh, the need for capital is very important, but what comes first, uh, capital or the contract? And at least in my experience, I haven't seen very many large companies be willing to give out meaningful contracts uh, to startups, uh, to businesses that are small and haven't been proven, even majority businesses, when they go to a new client, have to uh, walk up a scale. Uh, you're not going to be entrusted the very first contract uh, with something large or uh, strategic or important. And so how you approach each one of your customers uh, has a lot to do with what kind of service, how big is the contract, how critical is it to the, to the client, uh, do you need a partner to establish credibility, to ensure success? Uh, these are all questions that make this a difficult journey because there is no one standard model for every single little company or women-owned company that's out there. Uh, and so this is where this organization, certification, networking, partnering, I believe is so critical to the success of the entire effort. And like I said at the beginning, each one will have a little different twist to it, uh, depending upon uh, you know, the industry, uh, the, the size and experience of the women-owned business, uh, the amount of capital that's needed. There are so many variables uh, that it's almost impossible at a conference like this to set some standard out uh, that everyone can find. And that's why uh, these organizations, conferences, and uh, partnerships are, are so vitally important. Over. Thank you, Ambassador. I think you made some, you know, really important um, comments uh, as it relates to the desire of businesses that are small to grow and their ability to grow um, because they don't have a long track record. And so how can we as a community, um, based on all the things that we spend our money on, products and services, whether it's the large corporations, the governments, or the, the women business owners themselves, how do we all along that value chain leverage our purchasing power to create uh, opportunities uh, for sales and a track record and experience? And how do we get women into value chains 
in along that value chain in a place that makes sense. It might be, as you said, a, a subcontractor or a sub to a sub to a sub. So it might be, you know, a very small contract, but then you can prove your experience uh, and work your way up along that value chain. So I think that's a really important point about being realistic of uh, how um, uh, sales actually happen in the world. And we did get a question specific for Michael Robinson wanting to know, could you share a supplier diversity success story or an achievement and how has that evolved over the years? Michael? Uh, yes. As I had mentioned, our program has been in effect uh, since 1968, and there are numerous stories that I could tell. Uh, I won't give out the supplier's name because I don't have approval for that, but I can talk about there were a WBE or woman-owned business who started with us, uh, and I'll look at it from two perspectives, who started with us in the U.S., and they had a small amount of business. And just as it had been stated before, once you join or become a supplier, you do have to prove yourself. You have to prove that you're reliable, that you can provide the product and or service when needed, and you can meet the requirements. You have the quality. Those are critical because if you can't do those, you won't be able to grow with that business. But the business came in that the W the woman owned business came in to IBM and they came in as a subcontractor. They came in as a initially a second tier, which meant they weren't a direct supplier to us. They were a supplier to one of our prime suppliers. But over time that supplier grew. They moved from the U.S. to Canada, from Canada to Eastern and Western Europe. Now they are in the Middle East, and they are in China also. So over time, they grew with us. They understood our strategy, and they did the same thing that Fortune 500 companies do. They go to where the business is located, to where their customers are growing. And that's what that supplier did to with us. Now, I'll look at it the other way. We have some suppliers who started out with us in South Africa. And from South Africa, she has grown into several other countries on the African continent. And now she is looking into Europe also and providing us services in that area. So as I mentioned before, we do, we operate in 170 countries, and we do look for suppliers in each and every one of those countries. And that's why and I keep going back, and you've heard people talk about networking and identifying yourself. That's why it's great to belong to an organization such as We Connect, because number one, they will help you with those skills. They will help you with networking. They will help you with meeting those corporations such as IBM and other corporations that you can present your story to. And the key thing that each and every one of you want to do is to be given the opportunity to participate in the uh, proposal process. There are going to be some you're going to win and there are going to be some you're going to lose. That is the nature of business. But the key thing you have to learn is for any proposal that you lose, go back and ask why. And that's an issue that a lot of a lot of companies don't do. If they lose a proposal, they don't go back and say, why? Why did I lose? So that they can learn and the next time they can rectify that issue that they had so that they could even be better. So thank you, Elizabeth. Fantastic as always, Michael. These are little bits of gold, <laughs> gold dust uh, that you're sharing with all of us. Um, I would love to um, turn over to you, Dr. Bader. We have, you know, many questions from what appear to be women-owned businesses wanting to know um, how how do they access networks? How do they access financing? 
How do they get the word out about um, their business? And you have a lot of experience um, with getting the word out about the, your offerings um, and the value that you provide. Um, I don't know if you've tapped into invest, investment um, or working with banks, but I think there is a lot of curiosity um, if the UAE government um, or private sector uh, provide um, you know, opportunities for women to access um, finance or uh, business opportunities. So Dr. Bader would, would love your advice and guidance. Thank you. Unfortunately, in my experience, in my journey, uh, we didn't have access to finance. So everything has been uh, really done by being self-independent, which made it much harder, as, as you can imagine. Uh, however, nowadays, there are so many initiatives in terms of the government that's taking as well as uh, the private sector. I don't know about specific, if you will, avenues that are now active and that are catered specifically for women. But I knew that there has been several discussions about supporting female. I tried actually during the pandemic to reach out and find out if there is anything that can support our cash flow during you know, the, the, the crisis that we are in. Uh, but I, I did not find, and I'm sure there must be uh, some organizations, but we don't know. So one of the things that I think will make the, the PPP much more successful is awareness. So you know, like the people that are asking the questions, if there's any entity or any program out there, please make it visible, uh, promote it, market it. Uh, you know, uh, it should be in, in, a, in a certain area where somebody can go and know about it. So from my own experience, there could be some support system that I am not, not aware of. Uh, in terms of networking, it's, it's super essential and very important, but I always say it has to be based on you know the the initial intent what are the specific objectives of this network so i mean we need to be very selective in terms of what network we want to be associated with it's not just about collecting business cards and put them on your desk it's about you know the, the quality and what is this network going to contribute to me as an individual by the end of the day and there are endless if you will organizations like yourself that i just came to learn about where you have specific objectives. It's not just about having women you know, connecting together, but there are much more objectives that will, will convert into tangible outcome and results. And this is what we really need. And of course, I mean, it has to be inclusive. So like, you know, the, the good network should be very selective in terms of qualifying the you know participants that uh, are going to be as part of this network so this is how you can ensure that you have certain qualities by the end of the day there has been so many networks that i have participated in that i just found them waste of time you know if, if i want to go and have a chat with my friends over a cup of coffee i can do it. i don't have to do it as you know business uh, in a way However, once you are into such a network, it's very important for this network to have both angles, you know, the professional part and the, and the softer part, the, the human being part. So it will be good to have the formal training, you know, and, and, you know, all the right processes in place, but also to have ability to network with one another uh, in, in a social uh, way. But, but once we have the right basis, this will, this will make things much easier. The other thing that I say, you know, we've, we've engaged with several accelerators and we're working more and more on that because one of the main elements that, that startups fail is because they are not able to hire and find and build the right leadership team. So we've been trying to work with accelerators to, to bridge that gap, to help them in terms of their training, in terms of you know, the HR aspect, how do I select, how do I build, how do I you know, uh, put the right processes in place, as well as to work on specific programs that are user-friendly, budget-friendly, that you know, can enable startups when they have very, very much of, of a small budget. And you know, we all know, for example, that for women versus men, to, when you start up, there are so many statistics by BCG and others that for usually the average amount of money that a female can generate is in the range of 50,000 US. And I'm talking about the most developed country, which is the US, versus 1 million average per male. So just imagine, you know, from the beginning, when we're starting the journey, 
you have this unfair, if you will, accessibility to finances that can support you. And, and there are so many statistics that shows if we have equal participation equity in terms of women and men entrepreneurs, uh, how this will impact on the economy. So, I mean, I do appreciate the social, the corporate social aspects of it, but you know, the, the way how I look at things, it's pure business imperative. It does really have the right return on investment. When you put more diversified slates into your boards, into your leadership team, into your SMEs, when you allow more engagement with, with, with other than, you know, the norm, the, norm, the classical. Uh, and, and it's endless, the statistics that we have, how much this will, will convert into higher GDPs, into, you know, uh, uh, better dividends for stakeholders, etc. Thank you, Dr. Bader. Um, lots of words of wisdom. Thank you for sharing your personal experience. Um, I know it's very challenging to start and grow a business for anyone, um, but in particular for women and other underutilized groups, it, it is, can be even more challenging. So I know we only have a few minutes left. This has been a very fast paced and I think super interesting conversation. I know we didn't get to all of the, the questions uh, from the participants, but we will work hard to do follow-ups after this. Um, and Ambassador, do you happen to have, um, you know, in a minute, any other words of wisdom you want to share with us, words of encouragement? Of conferences and webinar. There you go. Uh, can you hear me now? I yes. suppose you can. I just heard I was unmuted. Um, the, uh, the critical part is you need to do a lot more of these. Uh, the, the questions out there point out to the diversity, uh, the, the sophistication, the number of, uh, of unknowns that are out there. And in order to be able to educate women-owned businesses sufficiently to take advantage of this emerging opportunity uh, is, uh, is critical to its success. And so uh, I would say the more of these that you can do, and perhaps make them a bit longer uh, and give a lot more opportunity to questions and answers. I think that's where the real value comes in. Uh, as much as I appreciated giving my opening statement, I think I can provide more value in the future by act answering specific questions and how my experience uh, can perhaps lead to unlocking uh, some of the answers that uh, uh, your, uh, your participants are looking for. Over. Thank you, Ambassador. We are going to be taking you up on that because um, I know that I have lots of questions for you and I'm certain everyone else does too. So thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. Uh, that's a really big deal um, given how very busy you are. So thank you um, for sharing. Uh, Michael Robinson, do you have any closing thoughts to share with us? Hi, Elizabeth. Uh, I was waiting to, to the unmuted sound uh, direction came. The, we've talked about, and everyone knows, uh, the financials involved and cash flow involved. And that's an area that a lot of times we center on when talking about women-owned businesses, diverse-owned businesses, small businesses in general. The other thing that I would point out is just as valuable as cash flow. The second leading cause of failure has been found to be having a strategic direction, both long-term and short-term strategy. I'm old enough to remember that if you wanted to go from one part of the country to another, you had to have a map. And if you didn't have a map or you didn't have directions because everybody has it in the GPS and their phones now, you would get lost. And that is a critical need for businesses and small businesses today. Yes, be concerned about cash flow, but on that same term, same token, have your short-term strategic directions and your long-term. Understand where you're going, modify that, and make sure everyone in your business is aware of it, they're on board, and they're following you. Thank, Thank you, you, Michael. Thank you. We're at time. Um, Dr. Bader, do you have one word to sum up every, summarize everything? One word of encouragement. <laughs> I think if I were to yes. summarize it for you, what is it? Is it passion or something else? 
persistent? Yeah, I was, uh, sure, I mean, passion, but also I would say uh, be very open for uh, criticism and feedback. It's extremely important to learn and ask the question and to know what needs to be modified and be better. Try to, to tailor made uh, uh, your services to be of high quality, but matching each and every unique client's needs. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Bader. Let me turn it over quickly to the Ministry of the Economy, our host, AIM. Thank you very much for hosting all of us. Karen, just want a quick thank you from all of us um, for being such a leader in this space. It's an honor to get to partner with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Elizabeth. Uh, really, the session today really empowered me more. Um, thank you to all our panel of experts for joining us today and taking time from their schedule and sharing their thoughts and perspective with us. I would like to thank once again our multilateral partner Islamic Corporation for the development of the private sector and the Head Credit Insurance for sponsoring this webinar. Uh, sharing the questions. The link to today's webinar video and presentation will be sent to you via email. And we are also conducting a short survey to get your feedback on today's webinar. So the link to the survey will be shared with you via the chat and via email. To register for our next webinar schedule for the 27th of July 20, please visit our website, www.aimcongress.com slash webinars. And also follow us on our social media channel to keep yourself updated. Thank you once again. Thank you, Ms. Elizabeth. Thank you to all our panelists. We look forward to seeing you on 27th of July. Bye for now.